A very good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the first Spotlight event of the ISB Leadership Summit 2020. Today, we have with us an individual who needs no introduction, a mystic, a spiritual guru, a life coach, someone who has touched and inspired millions of lives. However, he describes himself as the uneducated guru, and interestingly enough, that is also the literal meaning of Sadhguru. We are very excited to meet him and we have a lot of questions for him. We'll have the man of the hour, Sadhguru, join us. Namaskaram to all the young, young uh, leaders in the making. Namaskaram to all of you at ISB. Namaskaram Sadhguru, thank you for joining us here today and a very warm welcome to the ISB Leadership Summit. I am Shwetab, and along with me are my peers Arvind and Mridu. So, Sadhguru, we are very excited to meet you and we have a lot of questions on behalf of our cohort that we'd be asking you. But before we begin, would you like to share with us a few words? <clears throat> Jananam Sukadham Maranam Karunam Milanam Maduram Smaranam Karunam Kalavashadiha Sakalam Karunam Samayadipate Akilam Karunam Walla why this invocation? Because the moment you utter something, people think uh, you're praying to somebody. No, this is not a prayer, this is an invocation because it's very important as human beings that we have a multifaceted mind. It can think of many things. So when we want to do something specific, it's important. Our mind, our emotion, our energies and essentially our consciousness is focused in the direction of what we wish to do. So invocations are towards this, that before we start a certain activity, we orient ourselves to that activity. Because right now this is the biggest problem that human beings do not know how to handle their own intelligence. When they're doing this, they will be thinking about that. When they're doing that, they'll be thinking about this. In this, all human potential is gone. Human genius simply does not unfold because all the time when they're home, they're doing work. When, are at, when they're at work, they're home. Now they're working at home, I know, but they're somewhere else <laughs> So... This is a fundamental thing that we need to bring into all the students and the future leaders that you must evolve mechanisms if you can or we can give mechanisms with which you can orient yourself towards a particular task that you're doing right now. Everything in you, your body, your mind, your emotion, your energies should cooperate willingly. You shouldn't drag them along because anybody who is dragged along is one thing a burden, another thing is they are endless trouble. If you drag somebody with you to some place, you will see they are an endless source of problem. Your own body, your own mind, your own emotions become an endless source of trouble for most human beings in their lives, simply because they're dragging their mind, they're dragging their emotion, they're dragging their energies to places where it doesn't want to go. They've not oriented them, they've not made them willing. So this is a fundamental thing that everybody should take care of, especially if you want to be a leader in the world in some capacity, 
then it's extremely important because you, if you cannot manage your own thought and emotion, <laughs> how are you going to manage a thousand people? It's going to be a joke. Thank you so much for your words, Sadhguru. I, with the dragging thing, I just related to my mother, dragging me to all the parties I did not want to go. <laughs> <laughs> At least she is taking you to a party, man. <laughs> not to a spiritual talk. <laughs> I would have loved that. <laughs> so, with that, Sadhguru, I think we'd start with the first question for the evening. So, Sadhguru, the question is that uh, I am very attached to my studies and to my work, sometimes to an extent that I have nightmares about pending deadlines and pending assignments. At a B school where there's so much of competition and pressure, these problems have just amplified. And I feel very difficult to share this with my friends and family who are not here because that would worry them. I have a constant sense of despair and I feel better only if I hear some good news, like good grades. And even then, it's very short-lived. So Sadhguru, my question is that how do I build a healthy detachment from my studies and work? Well, uh, if you're detached, this happened very early on in my life. I was very detached from my education, so largely, I did not enter the school gates whenever it was possible. You will also become like that if you're detached <laughs> I'm saying. So detachment is not what you seek right now. What you want is troubling you. That's something that you have to seek. It is not your mother's party which is troubling you. What you want to do? You're here because you want to do this and that's troubling you. Why is this? Well, there are many aspects to this. I think ISB has uh, set up a, a certain stip stipulation that uh, if you want to come and study there, at least whatever one or two years or whatever, you should have worked somewhere. Because uh, they want you to come in a willing mode, not in an unwilling mode, because a whole lot of fresh MBA students may be there because of family pressure or social pressures or something. But somebody who's been working gives up their job and comes back to educate themselves, that means they want to do it. Because there is no point working with people who are unwilling, you know. You are there because you want it. So what you want is bothering you because you are attached to it. See, it's like this, let's say we put you in a football team. But you still uh, did not know how to dribble a ball properly and ball never comes to you, if it comes to you, it goes away. Naturally, you will be in despair, not because you're attached, simply because there's not enough work gone into it. So right now, is this business school beyond your intelligence? I don't think so. It is very much within your capabilities. It is just that somewhere we are thinking, this is a fundamental flaw in our education system. Somewhere right from your kindergarten school, they have made you misunderstand memory as intelligence. You think memory is intelligence. Well, memory was okay when you had to remember twenty-six alphabets, you managed to do it. When you had to remember whatever little mathematics, arithmetic, you know, I don't think they're memorizing anymore. When we were growing up, we are supposed to say in our sleep, they'll wake us up and say, six into thirty-six, how much? You're supposed to say it, otherwise you're supposed to be dull. Not because you multiply in your mind, you people remember just like that. So memory has been misunderstood as intelligence. In today's world, all of you are exposed to technology, you know, a simple machine that you carry in your pocket, a phone, has ten times or hundred times more memory than you. So your memory is meaningless, I'm saying, it always was. It is useful to a certain extent. So what education should have focused on is raising your level of alertness or attention. Your attention or the quality of your attention can be raised to higher and higher levels. If that happened, Believe me, whatever is happening in your business school is not a great challenge for you. It is not at all a challenge for you, I'm telling you. It is a challenge because you're trying to... You come from a education system where men memory has been misunderstood. 
because memory has been misunderstood as intelligence, you misunderstand thought as the ultimate thing. Thought is just a recycling of the data that you already have. You cannot think about something for which you have no data. Hello? Yes or no? You just cannot think about something for which you have absolutely no data in your head. So this means what? You will go on doing permutations and combinations of the same damn things forever, if thought is a p premium thing. No, human attention is the real thing. If your attention rises to a certain level of quality, you will see everything, the universe is an unfolding for you. It is not a locked up space, it's an unfolding for you. Your genius will un naturally unfold. So this business school will not be a challenge for you. Right now, you have to get off that, but you have probably twenty years of training as to how memory is more important than this because all your examinations were structured in this way, that you… you uh, drink up a textbook and puke it out on the exa examination hall in… under scrutiny, you have to puke, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, you may pick up somebody else's puke <laughs> <laughs> so, if you puke it under scrutiny, then you will be declared as the most intelligent man in your batch of students or whatever. So, this you must give up, not just for the sake of being in ISB. If you want to be a leader, you need attention. You must be able to grasp things for what they are, not for what you think it is. You can think whatever nonsense you want. But grasping what is there is most important, isn't it? If you want to come up with solutions, you have to grasp what is there. But if you're always thinking, first of all, your thought may not be in reality with the existence that is there. Your thought may be of yesterday, what is today may be totally different. This is happening to a whole lot of leaders, they're living in another time. This is not only business leaders or political leaders, even spiritual leaders, they're all living in another time. They're going on talking about something that happened thousand years ago, two thousand years ago. So this is because they're not alert to the situation there is, there is no aliveness. Life is responding. Life is not remembering something that happened hundred years ago. Life is responding to what is there right now. So the same thing your intelligence has to do, it has to respond. If you respond, believe me, this will not be a challenge, you don't have to be attached or detached to it, that is not what is needed. What is needed is involvement. If there is involvement, there is attention. If there is attention, there is clarity. But right now we are trying to muddle ourselves with thought and memory, too much memory and thought process, so there is no clarity. This means our own intellect has become a kind of a cataract for the deeper intelligence that we are as a life. As a life, there is a fundamental intelligence within this. When I say there is a fundamental intelligence within this, if you… Uh, oh, I was just about to say something else. You're a North Indian guy, you just eat roti, all right? You can make a… Ro put a roti in your stomach. If you're South Indian, there's one guy there, I think Arvind is there. Uh, he's tasted many more things. <laughs> Even I have tasted yeah. Sadhguru. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you taste it in North India, you taste idli in North. We… what I see is as I move from Tamil Nadu up North, up North, up North, the idli slowly becomes harder, harder, harder. By the time I come to Haryana, it is like a golf ball <laughs> Anyway, if you put a piece of roti in your stomach, there is an intelligence, not even your head, your stomach has intelligence to transform this roti into a human body. When I say human body, I'm talking about the most sophisticated machine on the planet right now. Most evolved machine on the planet is this one, all right? This is a super, super, super computer. And you do this with what? With roti, huh? You have brilliance inside of you, but you are not able to access it. That's the whole thing. Thank you for that answer, Sadhguru. I'll try to eat more rotis, more better way. <laughs> hey, don't get all the North Indians against, against me, huh? It's only the food I'm saying, rest is okay with me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sadhguru. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sadhguru, so uh, I have a question about uh, a dilemma in a workplace setting. So, in my last workplace, I used to work in the sales function. 
so very often uh, you know my manager would ask me to lie to clients and if i would question him he'd say you need to fake it till you make it so in this setting it's it's hard to stick to a principled approach because i have to pay the cost very professionally for this right so what is the best way to navigate this in a workplace setting in the modern world <laughs> what were you selling huh? <laughs> that you have to fake it till you make it what were you selling don't tell me <laughs> no but Today, in sales you want to uh, talk about what clients you have and things like that so sometimes there'd be a little exaggeration showing your past clients that you don't have as clients anymore so small lies uh pay uh, i mean you feel like you're willing to you know say that small <laughs> lie but then there's a slippery slope at work right so how do you navigate that ethical dilemma of you know staying true to some principles and also keeping your professional growth uh, in mind in the workplace uh, do you remember your mother was such a big liar when you were just one year old hmm. huh do you know this that she told you she showed you a ball of curd rice and said it fell off the moon and you ate it up to make you eat <laughs> she told you many things but she was not lying for her well being she was lying for your well being hello so do not go with this uh, very rigid sense of what is true what is false what is false is anything that's against life is false anything that is for life is true hello that is the truth right now suppose suppose i'm in your isb talking to you let's say live right now we are uh, you know the virus has kept us with some distance uh, suppose all of you have gathered thousand of you are there in a hall as i coming in as i am coming in a terrorist who strapped up with bombs around himself because he wants to have maximum impact he asks me where where are the people i will point him in the opposite direction that way or shall i point him towards you hello should i should point towards you be truthful no the other way the other way where there's no one hopefully yeah. i will point the other way without hesitation i'm saying i will not sit here and struggle moral dilemma because my life is based on my humanity not on my morality so as long as you don't forsake your humanity it's okay the actions in the world have to be done the way it have to be done but i don't know what you were selling and what your boss was asking you to lie i am not condoning that but i am saying if in your life let the guideline be your humanity always an overflowing sense of humanity that is the guideline not silly morals that you have taken up because these morals are different in every society and everybody knows how to bend it and twist it all right according to their needs so this is why somebody says uh, fake it uh, till you make it whatever <laughs> nice slogan <huh? laughs> i didn't know where they did this <laughs> but the important thing is of humanity will you forsake your humanity because you want to sell something please don't ever do that that's not worth doing because this is all you have this is the only real thing you have is this all right you're a human being this is a life and this has a certain humanity do not forsake that as long as you do not forsake that actions are according to the need of the hour all right actions in different times will be different if we were here 1000 years ago how we would act and how we act today how we may act 10 years later are all different isn't it always previous generations and current generations have troubles going on because they have different sets of values don't go by these values and moralities the most important thing is is your concern inclusive or exclusive this is all if you are constantly concerned about all life around us whatever it takes please do it huh? because that's all that matters in the end thank you sir i think that makes a uh, lot of sense that not stuff namaskaram sadguru so i have a childhood friend she grew up in a very uneasy family environment because uh, her parents had a very strained relationship due to which she grew up amongst constant fights with lack of love so across the years uh, i've seen her grow up as a person who's become very reserved she does not believe in love she doesn't believe in the power of relationships so how can we uh, sort of not let such toxic relationships impact us so negatively in life 
See, everybody is finding a certain excuse for their own miseries. So, my parents were like this, so I am like this. Well, this is unfixable because we can't change your parents now, all right? Hello? Can we change them now? So, you need to understand this, especially if you have gone through tough situations in life or horrible situations in life, let's say. Is it not important that you become wiser sooner than other people? Sooner than other people who have grown up in comfort, who do not know what it is to see those things, is it not very important that you should become wiser? No, instead you choose that you also become miserable because they were miserable people. So let us understand this much. You have an intelligence to recognize that they are living badly. How come you don't have an intelligence to recognize you are living badly right now? And you don't even have the fundamental integrity to see if I am living badly, it is me who is making this. Because there may be situations and situations. For every one of us, there are situations. In fact, the more you try to do in the world, the more and more many ugly situations you will have to face whether you like it or you don't like it, okay? Now, because you face ugly situations, will you also become ugly or you will use this as manure to blossom into your wonderful flower? This is a choice that you have. So everything that hurts us, everything that in some way uh, is negative to in a given situation, whether you will become wise or you will become wounded is your choice. Do not look for ideal situations because there is no such place. There is no, ch no such place. Wherever you go, there will be something happening that you think is negative. Whether it's negative or not, I don't want to make a judgment. But in a given place, you think there is negative. A whole lot of people who have applied to get into your uh, institution like uh, ISB, they are all thinking if I enter ISB, it is like heaven. But I'm sure there are many people in your institution who think this is the most horrible place, full of politics, full of nonsense, full of this. Aren't there such people? Hello? I'm sure they are there, you don't become one of them. Because in every place <laughs> there are issues, all right? Where there are two people, there is an issue. How we conduct these issues depends on are we in a state of conscious response to these issues or are we in some compulsive reaction to these issues? This determines how we conduct ourselves. So, whatever happened in your early age, this has become a syndrome all over the world because they've all read a little bit of Freud, little bit of Maslow, little bit of all this European uh, psychiatric stuff. And everybody is a psychiatrist. Because my parents were like this, I am like this. Come on, huh? where is your intelligence? If your parents were like this, you must take a wow, you will never ever be like that. Hello? Yes or no? If your parents lived so badly, if it is true, I don't even know whether they lived badly or not. This is her perception of it, all right? We do not know how they lived, but going by her words, assuming it is true, if they lived badly, is it not your business to see Never ever you commit such mistakes as they're committing in their lives. Is this… is this not what human intelligence capable of? Or human intelligence is like, you know, they study rats and make all kinds of conclusions about human beings today. They're not very wrong because a lot of people are still living like rodents. A whole lot of experiments about human beings are on rodents. Be looking at the behavior of the rodents, people say, oh, human beings like this, like this. Is it not a sad story, being the most evolved creature on this planet? I want you to understand, for you to come to this level of intelligence, it's taken millions of years of work of evolution to get you here, to the peak of evolution on this planet. So being the peak of evolution, are we displaying that we are at the top of the world? Are we? No, we want to sit on somebody else's head and think top of the world. No, we are already top of the world as human beings, isn't it so? But look at the way we are behaving, all the time complaining about something or the other. Let us understand this. What the world thro throws at us 
is not necessarily your choice. But what you make out of it is entirely your choice, yes? What you make out of it is entirely your choice. Your experience of life, this much you must come to every one of you young people, if you want, if you want your potential to open up in the world, one important thing that you must fix in your life is your experience of life, either peacefulness or uh, agitation, either joy or misery, blissfulness or, uh, you know, uh, suffering, whatever it is, your experience, your experience is entirely made by you. Other people are doing what they want, their drama they're conducting. It is your reaction to that which is causing these experiences to you. Right now, if I abuse you, I won't, I'm just telling him, Rudu. <laughs> Suppose I abuse you, the abuse is in my mouth. It is not a bullet, it doesn't come and hit you, but it's your reaction which causes the suffering, isn't it? Suppose I abuse you nicely in Tamil language or Telugu or Kannada, this guy will understand that's a problem. But uh, <laughs> if I abuse you in a language that you don't understand, with a smile on my face, you will think I'm saying sweet things to you, isn't it? And you… you'll respond nicely to me. So I'm telling you, your experience of what is happening with you right now is one hundred percent determined by you. Human experience ha happens from within, not from outside. Outside influences are there. How far we allow them to affect us, unless they're physical situations. You're in a war zone, somebody's shooting at you, that's a different matter, all right? That needs to be dealt with in a different way. Even there, a conscious response will give you better chance of survival than wild reactions. So, the privilege of being human being, is this that we have an intelligence to determine what should be our experience of life. Other creatures are in a natural, instinctive, compulsive reaction. We are supposed to be above that, but most human beings are trying to disprove this, and they are also in a compulsive state of reaction. And above all, parents, well, they are living the way they know best, isn't it? If they knew any better, they would have done better. They're doing their best. Well, they gave birth to you, which is a phenomenal thing. Maybe not willingly, but they gave birth to you one way or the other. And they gave you enough food and education and nonsense, whatever you needed, and brought you up to this level. Now, don't keep on looking at the rear view mirror forever. They brought you up, you've grown up into an adult, you survived, all right? Many children die early on. Parents not being able to provide, a whole lot of millions of children die in the world because parents are not able to provide for the children that they give birth to. They brought you up, you've grown up, you are in the rear view mirror. Please, leave the rear view mirror and look ahead because you can't fix your past. There is no way you can fix an yesterday, but you can create a tomorrow. Let's make that happen. Super insightful, Sadhguru, I'm just out of words. Thank you so much. Ah. Uh. Sadhguru, so my question is one that a few different students uh, from business schools particularly will relate to, which is life at a B school almost necessitates, you know, working really late because to start with the academic workload is pretty heavy and then you have a lot of extracurricular activities and then you have group study assignments. So inevitably people end up studying late into the night and many people also prefer it because the night is a quiet time and they find that they're able to focus. So, the opportunity cost of sleeping too much is uh, very, very high and many people just can't afford to do it because they'll be missing out on assignments and things like that. So, in such a work environment, how would one uh, really manage and look out for their quality of health and quality of sleep? Because you also function a slightly different uh, sleep schedule as opposed to the rest of us but manage to stay healthy. Well, uh... In the business school, uh, they're staying awake in the night. See, whichever way you do it, there are only twenty-four hours in a day. I've been requisitioning for more hours for a long time and haven't gotten any yet. Only twenty-four hours. So now the only thing you have to determine is how many hours of sleep your body needs, all right? Not you, how many hours of sleep 
does the body need? If you yourself need sleep, that means you're trying to escape life. You made experience of life so terrible that you're trying to escape life. Body needs sleep because it's service time. Body needs to be serviced. It's a constantly running machine, so little if you run it slow at certain times, it gets serviced, that's the idea. So right now, if you have a... some kind of an automobile, or let's say you guys, maybe your new generation doesn't use automobiles anymore, you're all in computers, all right? Let's say you have a computer, which needs service once in six months, goes away for three days or six days, that means average one day in a month. All right, you can bear with this. But suppose your computer needs fifteen days of service per month, better to junk it, isn't it? Hello? Hello? So right now, you're talking about a body. It is a certain machine, all right? It's a biological machine, but it's a machine. It's a combination of many things, physical stuff, mental stuff, emotional stuff, chemical stuff, so many things, all put together a complex machine. Eight hours you sleep, at least probably one, one and a half hours goes into breakfast, lunch, dinner, all right? I'm assuming, but your dinners may be very long, I don't know. And uh, then bath, toilet, this, that, another two hours goes in this and that management of, you know, clothing, this, that, what, whatever. So essentially, you're spending twelve hours in a day for maintenance. So you are that kind of machine which needs fifteen days in a month maintenance. This means half your life is just maintenance. How will you be productive, I'm asking? You said it necessitates nightlife. Well, you said two things. One thing is, it's quiet. Believe me, early mornings are much quieter than nights. You wake up at 3.30 and see everything is dead quiet. Ah, twelve o'clock, it's still not quiet. Not in uh, Chandigarh, I'm sure. I hear a lot about Chandigarh's lifestyle these days. Definitely at uh, even twelve, one o'clock, still activity is going on. Vehicles are... automobiles are going on. Wake up at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning and see everything is quiet. There are three kinds of people who want to stay awake in the night. Yogis, rogis and bogis. Well, we'll start with the bogi. One who is looking for, you said, extracurricular activity. We don't know what that is. I don't want to inquire into that, okay? Bogies are those who are pleasure seekers, for them night is a conducive time. So they always, in the world, this kind of activity is called nightlife. Nightlife does not mean studying in the ISB, all right? Nightlife means being on the street and doing something else, whatever that is. And a rogi, somebody is sick, he cannot sleep. Inevitably, he stays up in the night because he cannot sleep. If he lies down, he will cough, he will do this, he will do that, so he will sit up. A yogi also sits up for a different reason altogether. So these are the three kinds of people, yogis, rogis and bogis. Which one are you? You must first determine. You are sure not a rogi. Between a bogi and a yogi, you must decide. Well, yogi need not necessarily mean you're sitting and meditating, you're studying. This is also yoga. Study means what? Something that is not a part of you, you're trying to make it a part of yourself. This is what yoga means. Yoga means union. You got yoked with something. It could be knowledge, it could be an experience, it could be cosmos, it doesn't matter what. But in some way, you're doing some yoga. So you think night is better. This is just a question of lifestyles. This is because in the last fifty years, we as a nation and culture are taking cues from Western societies and paying a big price for that. You will always see people who wake up early in the morning are of a different quality. People who sleep late and wake up late, they are of a different quality. Have you noticed this? So, 
waking up early in the morning, you will see you will have a better sense of usage at usage of time than sleeping late night. Well, at a certain time, on a certain day, if it happens, it's fine, that's not the point. But as a lifestyle, if you sleep late and wake up early also, that's wonderful. But if you cut down your sleep, are you able to be active and alive through the day? That's a question mark. That will only happen if you enhance your energy quality. If you raise your energies in a certain way, then you will see your sleep quota will shrink. Not because you're trying to avoid sleep, simply because you need less maintenance. Less maintenance means in some way, the system is going in a more efficient way that it needs less maintenance. If any machine is working very smooth, it will need less maintenance, isn't it? So why is this friction happening within you? What causes this friction? How to eliminate this friction? What are the things we can do? This is very well addressed in the science of yoga. Every aspect of it, from cellular health to your energy and whatever. But to put it in a very fundamental way, let's look at life this way. See, there are only two ingredients to your life. I... I didn't uh, go about explaining the chant that I made in the beginning. This is what it means in a way. There are only two ingredients to life. You have a certain amount of time and a certain amount of energy. This is all life is, isn't it? Hello? This is all life is. A whole lot of people are not conscious about this. They don't know that they have a limited amount of time. Well, intellectually they may know, but experientially they are not walking on the street being conscious of the mortal nature of their existence. Being conscious of your mortal nature means you know you have a limited amount of time. See, right now, you... you... let's say day after tomorrow is your examination. Now you still not opened your textbook or whatever book you have to open. Now you become conscious, I have a limited amount of time and I have five hundred pages to read. How do I do this? So you will find innovative ways of how to do this. Yes or no? You will try in so many ways how to do this. Because right now you understand you have only this many days for this and what is in front of you is big, how to handle it. So this is what mortality means. For the entire life process itself, we have a limited amount of time. Now, whether we sit here and talk, time is rolling away both for you and me. Hello? Yes or no? We are forty-six minutes closer to our grave since we started. Just reminding you, it's not the watch that's ticking off, it's our life that's ticking away. Most human beings are not conscious of this. So time is rolling away at the same pace. So the only thing you can manage is the energies. If you keep your energies in such a way, what somebody does in ten years, you may do it in one year. So if both of you live for hundred years, in terms of impact and experience, you would have lived a thousand years. This is all you can do to enhance life. This is all you can do. You cannot stretch your time. Well, you may live a full length of life by staying healthy, but still, if you're sleeping uh, twelve hours of maintenance, eight hours of sleep, four hours of other maintenance, twelve hours a day is maintenance. If you live for hundred years, you lived only for fifty years, isn't it? In that five, ten years went in crawling and toddling uh, and doing all that stuff. So what is left is a very brief amount of time for most human beings. There is not enough time to unfold their own genius, to explore their possibilities simply because twelve hours of maintenance. Now the thing, if I... the moment I say this, I'm sure there'll be people in the audience who are internet, uh, the, you know, physicians. <laughs> they become physicians on the net and they'll say, no, but the doctors say you must sleep for eight hours a day. That is a prescription. Well, uh, I, I'm not here to insult anybody, but how many of them are healthy is a question mark, all right? This maintenance of this machine depends on how it runs, at what RPM it runs, to put it very simply. A given engine, how... at what RPM it runs also determines how soon it'll come for service and maintenance. 
So, how to run this machine in such a way? It's at ease always. It's always at ease. If you keep it this way and you work on your energies to a higher level of possibility, you will see the recouping of the body happens very quickly. What somebody does in eight hours of sleep, if you are able to do it in three to four hours of sleep, four hours extra you got. Four hours extra per day, you are way ahead of everybody else, isn't it? They are trying to chronicle my life, all the things that I've done, different places I've been to. Somebody asking me, Sadhguru, what, you lived here for three hundred years or what? <laughs> because one simple thing is, for almost twenty-five years on an average, I slept between two and a half to three and a half hours per day. Today, a little lazy, four and a half hours I'm sleeping, some days five hours plus I'm sleeping. But uh, if activity is necessary, very easily we can ward off that sleep and do it because you keep your energies in a certain way. So, instead of thinking of life in terms of whether I should sleep in the... I'm a night person or a day... Uh, morning person, you know, people are saying, I'm a coffee person or tea person, I'm this person or that person. You can be any goddamn person you wish. This is the freedom of being human, all right? The important thing is, how many hours of wakefulness, how many hours of maintenance, this will determine how you live. This is determined by what is the quality of machine that you kept. Suppose you're putting diesel into a petrol vehicle and driving, well, it will need uh, twenty days of maintenance per month. Yes or no? Every alternate day you have to take it there because you're putting the wrong fuel. So from how you eat, how you sit, how you stand, how you breathe, if you bring all this into your conscious process, you will see how you sleep will become very small because body needs rest, not sleep. If you know how to be restful, how to be peaceful, if you do not generate unnecessary chemical muck within your cellular structure, you will see the sleep quality will come down. Sleep quantity will come down and the quality will go up. Also, food is a very important factor and uh, I have been always already saying you're eating better food than uh, uh, Swetab <laughs> So, uh, what kind of food we eat, there are various dimensions to it. It's not just about protein, vitamin, minerals like this. There are other aspects to the food. And if we take these things into uh, consideration, then our sleep quota will come down, quality of our life will go up. What is one minute in somebody's experience will be many more minutes in your experience of creativity and impactfulness in life. So this is the only way you can enhance life because in terms of time, one minute is one minute for me and you. Whether we do something, don't do something, sleep, awake, Time is just rolling away, not waiting for anybody, isn't it? Yesterday went waste, so can we roll it back and live yesterday again? There is no such thing. There is no rewind on life, that's all I'm saying. You cannot rewind anything, it's gone. What's gone by a minute that's gone by is gone. So people are saying, I know in your uh, parlance in the business community, people are saying, time is money. What a stupid thing to say. Time is life, it's a fundamental of life. Okay, okay. Thank you, Sadhguru. So, basically by refocusing your energies, by eating good food, yoga, trying to stay at ease while doing work, I think uh, a lot of people will be able to live sustainable lives is what you're trying to say, right? That's a gist, because that's a very hopeful message for me. Uh, I did not say sustainable <laughs> See, but this... I can, no, no, I must tell you my experience. Uh, my early childhood, I'm made like this. Waking me up in the morning is a project, it's a very difficult project. So they make me sit up in the bed, I'll fall back and sleep. I'll... they make me sit up in the bed, my mother and my two sisters doing their best to get me out. If they make me get out of the bed, I will s sit there and fall asleep. Then they'll drag me to the bathroom and uh, my mother will put a paste on the toothbrush and give it to me, I'll stick it in my mouth and fall asleep. If nobody wakes me up, till I get super hungry or my bladder gets too full, 
till then I will sleep till noon time, if nobody wakes me up. I started practicing a simple form of yoga when I was little over eleven or maybe twelve years of age. Within about eight to nine months, maybe six to eight months, since then, wherever I am, whichever time zone I am, you know, whole lot of times, these days the virus has settled me down a little bit, otherwise every day I was in a different time zone. So, wherever I am, morning between 3.25 to 3.40, I will always come awake. If I wish, I can get up and do what I want. If I feel I need a little more rest, I can lie back and rest for some more time and wake up. Why I'm saying this is, there are certain cycles in the nature. Those cycles are manifesting in every life, including us. If you become little more conscious, you will see when certain changes are happening on the planet, the same things will happen to you and you will come awake. And that's how it should be, not by alarm bell. In spite of my schedules and all the time traveling, I never wake up to an alarm bell. I don't have an alarm actually. I still don't know how to set an alarm on my phone. This is not an admission. Hey, edit this, huh? <laughs> I shouldn't have said that <laughs> I have never set an alarm on my phone. I don't know how to set that because uh, I don't wake up like that. If I have to wake up early, catch an airplane, do this, do that, well, it will happen because the body is capable of that. Body. This is the most complex mechanism. Is it not important we learn to use this well? This is the highest technology on the planet, but most people have not read the user's manual yet. <laughs> Thank you, Sadhguru. I think that's an important page of the user manual that you've shared today. So, Sadhguru, my question is, while growing up, I formed a belief that Faithfulness was the foundation of any relationship, especially a romantic one. For me, love and fidelity are synonymous. However, some personal beliefs and some personal experiences rather have shaken this belief. I see committed people around me cheating on their partners. And for me, it's unimaginable to be in a relationship that's not faithful. This fear of infidelity and the pain that the hurt might cause holds me back from engaging in any romantic relationship. So Sadhguru, my question to you is that how do I overcome this fear so that I am able to experience the joy a romantic relationship brings? Uh, this fear that you have may make you a topper in the ISB. Huh? <laughs> I hope so, I hope so Sadhguru, <laughs> not happening yet. <laughs> So, uh, see, this is all uh, happening the way it's happening because uh, people are trying to live too early. When you should be growing, you're trying to live. No, no, you should wait a little more and grow up really well. Growing up really well doesn't mean just physically reaching a certain height or weight. Uh, all aspects of your life should reach before you mess with another life, I'm saying. Before you touch another life, uh, you must be in certain sense. But now that's been taken away, this is called freedom at the age of fourteen, fifteen, uh, you know, relationships are happening or even earlier it's happening, which is leading to all kinds of mess because you're still childish. You… you do not know. What are the consequences of this, what it is? Oh, there is no consequence, I've had this, this, this in my life, nothing happened. Well, nothing happens, that's what I'm telling you. Nothing significant happens in your life, that is the problem. See, the biggest problem of life is not that something happened. Nothing happened in your life, that is the worst thing to happen. Hello? Nothing significant happened, nothing impactful happened in your life. That is the worst thing that happened because you are going by your physical compulsions, here, there, whatever. I am not trying to be moralistic, that is not my way of looking at life. All I am saying is, tell me in your education right now, without being committed to what you are doing, do you think you will get somewhere with your education? I don't think so, Sadhguru. 
Tomorrow, let's say you start an enterprise. I'm saying an enterprise, not a job, because people go through jobs without commitment. If you start something of your own, do you think you'll take your business somewhere without a profound sense of commitment to it? No, Sadhguru, I don't think so. No. Not just being committed, you must be devoted. You must become a devotee of what you're doing. Only then the best will come out of you, you will give your best to it. Only then it may happen, all right? Even then there are question marks in the world. Whatever anybody has achieved, either as a business person or a politician or a spiritual person or a sports person or a musician or whichever arena of life you want to take, without being absolutely devoted to what they are doing, has anything truly significant happened in their lives, I'm asking. Has it happened? Not in my knowledge, Sadhguru. This also is true with your relationships. If you just want to philander around, that's up to you if that's what you have chosen to do. Because if you… if you make choices very early on, this is how you will make choices because your intelligence has already been hijacked by your hormones. It will take some time till hormones give you some relief and still after that you can still, you know, consider life more intelligently. It may take little time. In that phase, it is best that you focused on something else which is what the culture used to be, but now it's changed into a different thing, that's different. This is not a, a moral judgment on a generation of people or whatever. All I am saying is, if you want to know something profound about relationships, if you want to experience something very profound, this will not happen unless you're absolutely devoted to something. It will not happen. Well, you want just little pleasures around, it's fine, that's how you have chosen. You want to live the surface of life, that's up to you. But if you want to know the profoundness of every dimension of your life, the physical aspect of your life, the intellectual aspect of your life, the emotional dimension of your life, and the profound sense of being, on all these levels, if you want to know and experience life in a profound manner, that will not happen without being devoted to each one of those things absolutely, otherwise it will not happen. So now what... why this talk is... because there are only two things in your life. The value of your life is only in two things. Profoundness of your experience and the impactfulness of your activity. Yes or no? These are only two things that are there in your life. So if you value that, that your experience here should be profound and what you do must be impactful in the world, then without devotion, you're not going to do it. Without absolute commitment, you're not going to do it. Sadhguru, may I ask a follow-up question to that? Uh, something related to what you have said on this earlier. So Sadhguru, on the former part of the question, when you say that we start on very early in our lives, 14, 15, and that is one of the reasons for this trouble because our intelligence is not that matured. Uh, also, you have spoken that a little later in our lives, when we are 25, 30, our beliefs are so strong, it's so concrete, and when we come across a person of the same age, there's a friction that's created. Uh, that kind of is a dilemma in my mind. Sadhguru, if you can please clear that, that will be really helpful. See, as time goes by, life should mature, not become concretized. Uh, suppose you look at a bird. Initially, life comes as an egg. Somewhere as life matures, the egg, the shell will break and it will hatch. Well, as a human being, you may have no such experience, but we were also in a certain kind of protective atmosphere of our mother's wombs, and then we came out. From there on, life should become more and more mature. Maturity also means freedom, right? Instead of that, a whole lot of people grow up like concrete blocks that they concretize themselves with full of conclusions about everything. See, if you want to grow, you should not have a conclusion about anything. You are willing to pay attention to everything that is there right now and keep growing with it because that's growth. If you make too many conclusions and two concrete blocks meet, only clash can happen. 
How can... how can anything else happen? If you are really growing up, see, as a child, when you were five, six, seven years of age, you were joyful by your own nature, huh? Somebody had to try hard to make you unhappy. Today, you are coming to a place that someone has to make you happy. Because you think somebody else is the source of your happiness, well, there is a lot of trouble. If you try to squeeze happiness out of someone else, that someone will make sure uh, your life is messed up in so many ways. Maybe not by intent, but in reaction. Instead of looking at, see, this is something we need to do. If two people have to come together, they must come together because they have something to share, wonderful things to say, one wonderful things to share. I'm saying as a... as a being, not just about saying. Right now, you're thinking the other person should be the source of your happiness. Well, that person will definitely become the source of your misery because no human being will ever, ever live to your expectations. You must know this. Nobody can. Well, you're in uh, Haryana, very close to Kurukshetra and all this, all right? <laughs> so let me <laughs> take this example. Right now, peop Krishna is a very celebrated lover, all right? most celebrated lover, it's everybody's dream, Krishna. But when he was alive, both his wives had serious trouble with him. They were complaining all the time. So I'm saying nobody ever found a situation where everything was ideal. But if your life is about, sh you know, expression of your joy, rather than in pursuit of happiness, you will see everything will become different. If relationships are about enhancing each other, it'll be great. If relationships... ships are about extracting from each other, it will become terrible. So, let us understand this. You are forming a relationship because you need it, all right? Your needs may be many. Physical needs, psychological needs, emotional needs, social needs, financial needs, we don't know what all needs. Whether your relationship is essentially need-based, your need. Initially, you form this relationship understanding it's your need. But once it happens, after some time you start believing it is their need which is keeping the relationship going. No, 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 it is your need which is the basis of your relationship. If you see this, you will always be grateful, you will always appreciate the other human being for whatever they are and it'll be fine. Above all, first thing is, you should not... you should not be a miserable human being trying to become joyful because of somebody. You're a joyful human being, forming a relationship with another joyful human being, fantastic. Otherwise, you must become an ascetic. At least it saves one more person. Thank you so much, Sadhguru. It, it does answer my question. So Sadhguru, when you agreed to come to ISP for this talk, not only our current batch, but our entire alumni community was very keen to answer and ask questions from you. So we have uh, two alum questions. Let's have the first question for Sadhguru to answer, please. Namaskaram Sadhguruji. Namaskaram. I'm Manu Subramani, an alumnus of the school. The question that I would like to ask you is that in this increasingly polarizing world, uh, for example, the U.S. presidential elections. Uh, what are the primary factors, basis which you would suggest that one should be choosing or electing a leader for themselves? Thank you. <laughs> See, I was... Uh, I don't know, this is... Uh, this has become like a standard chant all over the world, increasingly... increasingly polarized world, increasingly polarized world. Well, I would say the world is far more democratic than ever before in the history of humanity. In the past, if you look back and see, <laughs> anybody who was not your clan or your race or your religion, people were just killing them without a question. At least now they're asking some questions and then they attempt things <laughs> So, talking about the U.S. election as the most polarized, I was with one of those social media stars and they asked a similar question, never before America has been polarized like this. I said, well, you had a civil war, didn't you? 
Oh yeah, that we had, but this is more than that. This is not more than that, this is a democratic process. When an election comes, people will talk vehemently about their choices. It's perfectly fine. Democracy allows fiery speeches. As long as you don't talk about killing them, beheading them, murdering them, this kind of rubbish. Except for that, I can vehemently disagree with you, what is the problem? It's perfectly fine. That is what democracy is about. Because if you are not standing up for what you think is right, it may be wrong, you may be wrong, but you right now think it is right, so you standing up fiercely for it. It is very needed for a democratic process, otherwise there is no democratic process. But your fierceness should not become violent. You fiercely depend your... Uh, defend your view of how things should happen, all right? But this doesn't give you any right for violence because the fundamental of democracy is this, that change of power can happen without bloodletting on the streets. When I say this, I'm saying this because never before in the history of humanity, change of power happened without a few heads rolling. Always, always and always it happened this way. It is only in the last fifty to hundred years since the democratic process got established that you can change leadership without killing anybody, which is a significant development in human civilizations, all right? So, in America there are only two main parties, literally it's a two-party democracy, so naturally nearly fifty percent will be this way, fifty-one percent will be that way. That is the only way to win the election. Now you see this and say it is polarized. No, that's how it should be. If one party becomes ninety-five percent, another becomes five percent, then what is the point? There's no democracy there, all right? So it is good that the country is divided at the time of election into two halves. It's a good thing. But post-election, that divide should not continue because even if somebody that I do not like gets elected, once they're elected, we respect the institution for what it is. Whether it's a prime ministership or presidency or whatever the institution is, because democracy is a rule of institutions, not of people. Oh, I don't like this guy. Doesn't matter, you don't have to marry that guy, all right? You don't have to live with, live with him. The question is only, will this person be able to do justice for our country, whatever country we belong to, all right? For this nation, will this person be able to handle our nation well? Before election, we debate. Once people have voiced their choice, you bow down to that. I may not agree, but still you bow down to that because that is when democracy is effective. It's just like playing a game, I'm saying. You play a game, you want to win fiercely. If you don't want to win, how to play with you, huh? Hello? If I come and play a game with you, and you don't want to win, can I play with you? No, you want to win, then only we can play with you. But suppose you lose, you're all right, then we can play with you. I don't want to win, we can't play with you. I cannot lose, we can't play with you. Yes? I want to win, but if I lose, it's all right with me. This is democratic process. So, there is no polarization, yes, Today you see, you hear more noise because never before ordinary citizens were empowered to speak. Only media said what it said, they printed everything. Now everybody is able to publish whatever they want, all kinds of people. Some people who have an understanding of things, some people who have no understanding of anything, half wits, half brains, every kind of people have an expression on the social media. But they may be half-brained, but they have a full oath, so it matters what they say, I'm saying. They may be uneducated, they may not be in a business school, they may be doing nothing worthwhile, they may be drug addicts, they may be useless people, but they have the same oath that you have. So their opinion also matters. This is democracy. You may not like it, but this is democratic process. So the most important thing for a democratic process to be a productive process is, we must educate the entire population 
in a more comprehensive way, not just in terms of degrees, but in term... in a more comprehensive way, understanding the full breadth and depth of what this nation needs, what the people need. If everybody have some sense of this, then the voting will happen in a more educated and informed way, which is what needs to happen. That is not one day's job. A generation has to work for it, then only it'll be a successful process. Thank you, Sadhguru. That's indeed a very interesting take on the term increasing polarization globally. Uh, let's take the second alum question now. Let's uh, look at the second alum question, please. Namaskaram, Sadhguru. Namaskaram. Lord Ram and Lord Krishna were very different in their leadership styles. In my understanding, Ram would follow the books, whereas Krishna would not worry about the means if the end goal was right. Sadhguru, whose principles should a modern-day CEO emulate, Ram or Krishna? Are hey, you picking up two people from Uttar Pradesh, huh? <laughs> well, I... I understand the basis of that question. Should I play by the rule... should I play by the rule book or should I play by my conscience or consciousness? Well, it depends on what kind of situations and what kind of roles you have to play. See, at the time of Rama, you know, we call him Rama in southern India, okay? You cut off his name Ram. In Tamil Nadu, he's Raman, okay? <laughs> so, when it comes to Rama, he is playing by the book because you must understand at that time, one continuous conversation in that society is how to establish an order. This I can speak with certain uh, <laughs> context right now because uh, in the last month, more than uh, nearly forty days, I've been on road touching these uh, Native American nations. Also, all those places which were known as Wild West, the frontier of America. Why Wild West happened the way it happened was, there was not enough law. So a whole lot of people were outlaw, because the only way they could survive and thrive in that place was to do their own thing, where gun was the law in many ways for them. So they are living in that kind of uh, atmosphere, so all these Wild West outlaws became stars in United States. You know, they're celebrities. Huge following for them, even today, <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> there are... there is following. There are movies and movies about outlaws. Because the law itself was so ambiguous and so undefined that who is... who is the law, who is the outlaw was very, very... Uh, it's a mushy place. There's no clear distinction what is law, what is outside of law. So killing a man, is it outside of law? It was not, because the law was also doing it, the outlaws also were doing the same thing, so they are asking, what is the problem? Kind of thing. So, Rama is at that kind of time, when in this subcontinent, there was no described law. So, one important dimension of his life was, he wanted to bring order and civilization to that place. So he always talked about the thing, even if he saw it was very cruel what he was doing, for example, sending his wife back to forest the second time over, when she is pregnant, he knows it's wrong. He knows as a husband it's wrong, as a man it's wrong, but he is doing it because if I don't establish the law, who else will? If the king doesn't establish the law, all others will start doing their own things according to personal likes and dislikes. So this is, uh, on one level, a hugely admirable thing that you are willing to make very severe personal sacrifices for being a ideal administrator or to be seen as an ideal king by everybody because you want to be an inspiration to be emulated by the rest of the citizenry because you're just trying to establish a civilization, not really totally civilized. You're trying to establish the laws. It is like the Wild West, 
not exactly in those terms, but law is ambiguous. So, he is trying to make it very clear, this is the way to conduct your life. By the time Krishna came, civilization was established, well-established kingdoms were there, clear-cut rules of life, business and uh, warfare, everything was there. But just a handful of people were taking the law into their hands, twisting it as they want and doing what they want. Because, see, it is like when the law is not there, you have to treat it in one way. When the law is there and everybody knows what is the law, but they are finding an underhand way of doing things, now you have to treat it as a crime. So how you treat crime and how you treat an outlaw, I am trying to make a difference, there is not much difference, but I am trying to make a difference because somebody is out of the law because he has no sense of law in his head. Somebody is a criminal, he knows what's the law and he's subverting it intentionally, all right? Not because of the compulsions of the situation alone, but he's by choice subverting the law. So in Krishna's case, the people that he is handling, the do 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 brothers, you know, hundred do's, Duryodhana and co. Here these are people know who exactly know what is the law of the time, but they are intentionally subverting it. So he deals with them completely differently, not by the book, but by his wit, by his, you know, cunning also many times. In the war, he was very cunning because he knows these people, if you, if you go by the law and let them win, they are not going to give a just rule to anybody. They will do any way what they want to do, all right? They'll any way do what they want to do. They will not uh, go in a just manner for the people. So, he is dealing with him in a different way. So, these are two different contexts. These are two different times. So, there… what we need to see is, for their time, they are acting in a relevant way, both of them. Similarly, for our time, we must act in a relevant way. Now, law is hundred percent clear. You cannot be an outlaw, you cannot say, I don't understand. Right now, still, you know, like when we were growing up, <laughs> this is a big thing around the world. This is the time of uh, Fidel Castro and uh, Che Guevara and all this. We are all thinking revolution, revolution. In India, all this Charu Majumdar, Kanu Sanyal and uh, you know, all these people, uh, Somalu in the south, we are all super inspired by them and we want to go into armed conflict. Well, it took some time for me to come to my senses but otherwise I was almost there, okay? Some of my friends went. I went till there, but then I found that organization was as corrupt as anything else as the government is, so I stepped back. Why I am telling this to you is, that was a time when I am saying in sixties, seventies, we are still thinking this nation is not fully formed. But now this nation is fully formed, all our business should be is, to establish the constitution in everybody's minds and hearts. It's very important because that is where the largest well-being is. If I write my own constitution and you write your own constitution, nobody is going to be well in this place. If we… if we want to address the largest well-being of this nation, largest number of people in this nation, then we must go by a single law, single rule book. It's very important. Not even as Rama went, because Rama went in a, in a… by the word, not being just many times, just by the word, being extremely cruel to certain people, because he is trying to establish the law. But now that is well done, now we can look at justice in a completely more humanistic way. We can use the rule book as a guideline, that's what we are doing today in many ways. A few people have not come into the fold, unfortunately. But otherwise, the largest population in the country is looking at the rule book as a guideline and apply the law in a humanistic manner. That is the idea of a lower rule book. Rule book is not a, a gulletin to cut people's heads, all right? But at one stage, it is so. When in Wild West, they tried to establish law, how they established law was these judges were called hanging judges. That doesn't mean they were hanging. For anything, they were hanging people, just about anything. 
daily hangings in small towns, in a town of uh, a few hundred population, every day hanging, all right? Every day at least one guy will be hung. So hanging, 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 they kind of establish the law. Unfortunate, this happens to a country or a civilization when you're trying to establish a national... national identity or a civilizational identity in a very short span of time. When it happens over a long span of time, it can happen with much less cruelty. But when it tries to happen in a very short, brief amount of time, enormous cruelty will happen. This is what people call as revolutions, this is what people call as establishment of law, whatever. But when they try to do it in a short span of time, wherever you see in the world, whether it's United States or China or Russia, wherever, when they try to create a whole new civilization in a brief amount of time, it could only happen with enormous cruelty. So during Rama's time, it was that time trying to establish a civilization, but not in such a rush as it's been done in modern times. They took time, so there was no that level of cruelty, but there was cruelty. Sending his pregnant wife to the forest is a cruel thing, very cruel thing for himself. It's not just cruel to his wife and his children, it's extremely cruel to him. With that pain, he lived all his life. He was not somebody, he sent his wife away and he's happy. He lived with that pain every moment of his life. But he still did it because for him, establishing a rule book was very important. But Krishna's time is a different time. Our time is totally different time. So we must be current, we must be relevant to the times in which we exist. So, Sadhguru, just like our alums, our peers also have sent us questions from our cohorts which they'd like... Oh, ask the professors to not ask me very difficult questions, huh? <laughs> <laughs> just because uh, they were our alums, we let them go first. But now, we'd have a few questions from our cohort and our peers. Can we have the first question, please? Oh, you meant the peers, I'm sorry, I thought... Not uh, the professors, not the professors, Sadhguru. <laughs> okay, they save their okay. questions for us. <laughs> I can handle the student questions. The professors, if they ask question, I don't know if I can handle. Namaskar, Sadhguru. Namaskar. I am Narika. I have a one-and-a-half-year-old son and a teenage brother. I have seen my teenage brother getting affected by the social media craze. And I was wondering, what can I do as a parent to ensure that my child doesn't... Uh, his self-esteem is not affected by the social media. Uh, if you want your son to grow up without social media, by the time he's six years of age, you must send him to me, huh? <laughs> I'm bringing up a lot of children with a, a different sense of life and great enthusiasm for life without being involved in those kind of things. But anyway, social media need not be all negative. This is a, a tremendous technology and a reach. If we conduct this well, this can be a tremendous possibility. As you know, uh, I myself am on social media, social media all the time, but I am not on it because, uh, you know, whatever the content is put there, I don't know what they're saying in reply, I never see that, so I have no issues with that. <laughs> I say what I have to say because what I say is not because somebody approves it or disapproves it. I say, what I see is true. It doesn't matter what's the consequence, I say it anyway, because this is the position that I've taken, that bringing certain light to everything is more important on long term than being uh, able to please everybody around you, you know? So you say, what you see as true, it may not be appreciated right now, it may be appreciated after five years, ten years, hundred years, we don't know. Most human beings who are of certain profoundness were only accepted long after they were dead. Because of social media, there is a certain level of acceptance when you're still living. Otherwise, by the time they read your books and get it, usually you're dead and gone after hundred, two hundred years later, people appreciate what you have said. That's how the world has been till now. So social media per se is not an evil force. It depends how we use it and for what purpose we use it, all right? So, being influenced by social media is simply because probably that's the most exciting thing that's happening. One thing is to make yourself so exciting for the child that he would rather be with you than keep staring at the phone. 
Well, if you don't have much time to do that, that in some way people ask me, Sadhguru, how... how can I make my child look up to me? I said, you must become a superstar in his mind. Yes, you must do whatever you have to do. If he thinks a dancing person is superstar, you must dance. If you think a freaking person is superstar, you must freak. If you think... A, if he thinks a singing person is superstar, you must sing. Whatever he thinks is super, you must do that. Very important, because that's the responsibility of bearing or bringing a new life into the world. It's that not when you become a human being, it's not just reproductive activity. It's much, much more than that, because for other creatures, they just have to deliver them and make sure initial stages provide some food, that's it. A donkey becomes a donkey, horse becomes a horse, tiger becomes a tiger, everything becomes what it has to become, irrespective of upbringing. But a human being has come unformed in many ways. And that is the beauty of a human being, that we can consciously make this being in a certain way. It is not all fixed. By birth, everything is not fixed, only a few parameters are fixed. Rest is all open to nurture, rest is all open to influence. Because of this, giving birth to a human being is a much, much bigger responsibility than that of a tiger or an elephant or any other thing. Some of them are endangered, so that is a big responsibility, but otherwise, it is a much bigger responsibility to deliver a human child because it doesn't come ready-made. Having said that, one simple thing, I know you want some practical solution, you're a business person. One simple thing that you can do is engage the child at this age, I'm saying when he is one and a half itself, as much as possible with natural elements. Instead of, uh, you know, taking them to cinema or shopping mall or this or that and turning on the television, take them for a walk in the forest. You don't know where a forest is, you're living in a city. Okay, get him a grasshopper as a pet to start with. Then maybe he will graduate to a cobra, you don't know. But whatever, if he gets engaged with life, which... which... which you can only do by responding. See, if you... If you want to just get a pet parrot, you know, like when I was nine to... Uh, nine years of age, I got myself... I caught a parrot and brought it as a pet. Do you know if you have to make a wild parrot a pet, how much attention and ingeniousness you need to please him? He's not an easy guy to please, I'm telling you. You have to please him, you have to observe what he likes, what he doesn't like, everything you have to manage for him. If you cannot maintain the ecosystem, he won't stay with you. So this is also good training for uh, Svetab, for having good relationships. You can get a parrot <laughs> or a better a snake or something because it needs a lot of observation and involvement. If a child grows up with this involvement, instead of holidays, you taking them to uh, some shopping place and this and that, well, everybody need not go to, uh, you know, Africa to see wildlife. I'm telling you, just outside your city, on a Sunday morning, if you go out, some open place, which is not an agricultural land, something where there seems to be nothing, if you just walk there with your eyes open, there's an incredible amount of life and your child will be naturally interested in all these things. He's interested in a bug, he's interested in a grasshopper, he's interested in earthworm. Have you seen this or no? A child is interested in all these things. You must get him involved with life, because that is the healthiest association you can make, because he is alive. He thrives best with involvement and engagement with life always. Right now, in a human society, is that not life? No, this has just become thought, emotion, prejudice, ideas, philosophies, ideologies, belief systems. This is what most human beings have become, the social media is full of that. No, he must engage with life. Once there is a certain contact and an involvement with life, believe me, nothing else entertains you as much as engagement with life. Once that happens to someone at an early age, they will not get addicted to anything. They'll always be open to life. This is something that you can do. If you cannot do, you must send him to me <laughs>
That was a very, very practical answer, Sadhguru. Thank you. Uh, we will have just one more question from our peers. Can we please have the audio clip? Video clip, sorry. Namaskaram, Sadhguru. Namaskaram. My name is Taruna Hindani. I wanted to ask you that often I have seen people who get into spirituality, let go of their ambition and leave things to destiny. Does spirituality reduce one's hustle and ambition? Well, ambition, uh, see, there is a longing in every human being to be something more than what they are right now. Is that so for all three of you? Hmm? Whatever you are right yeah. now, you want to be something more. So whatever you are dreaming of as something more, maybe finishing this B school and you have a few companies, most of them are American companies <laughs> in your mind uh, that you must become something there. Why you… you are just thinking of a job, but I will make you tomorrow morning the CEO of that company that you are dream, dreaming of. Within a little bit of time, would you want to be something more? Yes or no? All right, you want to be something more, you want to be a CEO of ten companies, why like that? I will make you the king or queen of this planet. Will you settle? No, you will want the moon also. If I give you the moon, you'll want the other… Uh, other planets in the solar system. If I give you the whole solar system, you'll want the universe. If I give you the universe, you want the next galaxy and the next galaxy. So I'm saying there is something within you which is longing to expand limitlessly. When this longing to expand limitlessly finds a very constipated expression, that is called as ambition. Unfortunately, most people constipate this longing to expand limitlessly into a simple ambition, I want to become this. And by defin… by defining that, they will become extremely small. So ambition is a very small thing. Spiritual process means you have a larger vision. Ambition means you want to get a piece of creation in some way for yourself. Spirituality means you are not going to settle even if the whole creation is given to you, you want the creator himself, the source of creation you want. Tell me which is more ambitious in your perspective. So I'm saying, if you give up small desires and go for a big one, is that dropping your ambition? Not at all. It is just that what people hold as great ambitions, you can do it playfully just like that. Simply because your vision is larger than that, your expression of expansion is very, very rapid and big because of this, these things will happen effortlessly. A certain amount of comfort, certain amount of security is people's ambition, unfortunately. A whole lot of people's ambition is to find a job, to build their own house. These days somebody builds it for you. There was a time when you had to build it with your own house, which always was badly planned and quite a mess. And uh, where uh, Arvind comes from, there are uh, things, mane katti nodu, madhve maadi nodu, all that stuff. Now oh, you understand Kannada? So what this means… What this means is, the great achievements in life is this, if you want experience of life, build a house and see, and conduct a wedding and see. These are the profound experiences of life. I think this is the dumbest way to approach life. This is what ambition means, you hold small things as too big. Getting a job, earning a living, getting to a certain place of comfort, these are not great achievements in life. A human being is capable of something far, far bigger, okay, infinitely bigger than that. So please do not constrict yourself with simple ambitions, let there be a larger vision as to what you want to create. What is it that you want to create? As I said earlier, let me repeat this, the value of your life is only in these two things, profoundness of your experience, impactfulness of your activity, that's all that matters. Thank you Sadhguru, we'll now move on to the next section. So uh, Sadhguru, you're very… Uh, very quickly, so I mean you're very famous for of course being a spiritual guru but also very famous for having a good sense of humor and a quick wit. So we thought uh, we'll do a small uh, rapid fire round just to get to know some parts of you that maybe we don't know yet. So uh, if I could uh, shoot. 
So if you are not on the path of becoming a spiritual guru, what is a career or a profession or a trade that you would have loved to pursue? Well, well, people think I'm a spiritual guru, but essentially, I'm an explorer of life. If there was no spiritual dimension, I think I would still be an explorer, maybe of a different kind. Maybe I would be walking the equator or the poles, but I would still be an explorer, that's for sure, because for me life is an exploration. Right now, because the doors of the inner world or inner dimension opened up, I find this exploration far more exciting and limitless than traversing the planet. So I am on this, suppose these doors had not opened, I think I would be an explorer anyway. The fundamental quality wouldn't have changed, I'm saying the direction might have changed. Interesting, that sounds like a good life. <laughs> so, uh, Sadhguru, the next question is that uh, while we were applicants at ISB, as a part of our application process, we were asked a question that where do we see ourselves in the next five to ten years or what are our short-term and long-term goals? So I want to know, if you were an MBA applicant, how would you answer these questions? I would say I would be running the ISB in five years' time <laughs> Beautiful answer, which wish, wish we'd said that too. <laughs> so Sadhguru, on to the next one. Is there anything specific about the younger generation that gives you hope for the future of the world? Is there any hope for the future of this world anyway? Well, uh, I mean, <laughs> is there any hope for the future? If young people are… young people like you are thinking, if there is no hope, then it's a terrible thing. But uh, there is no hope or hopelessness about the world. It is about what we do today will manifest itself as world tomorrow. So what are we going to do today? Instead of having a plan and executing the plan, a whole lot of people are busy wanting a prediction. So, we will look at your hand, where are you going? We will look at the stars, where are you going? Well, most of the stars don't even exist, do you know what the stars you see in the sky? They do not exist. Looking at them, you are deciding where you are going. I can imagine where you will go with this. So, do not look for predictions. It's very important. We decide where the world will go tomorrow. We must decide as a generation of people. That is when we can call ourselves human beings. Otherwise, like, we are like any other creature. Human being can determine what will be tomorrow. Yes, to a largely, to the largest possible extent, it's possible to do that. So, the young people, what hope do they give? See, one thing I see is just now somebody was complaining about social media. Though as confused as it looks, this social media thing, one thing is, people are communicating with each other. People are more exposed to each other than ever before. People would not trust anybody beyond their family, their community, their nation or their identity, whatever it was, race, religion, many things. But today, people are communicating, seem communicating seamlessly. You know, uh, a whole lot of people in, uh, you know, India and Pakistan are always uh, at the border, we are rubbing at each other. But whole lot of Pakistanis following me and, you know, regularly in contact with us. This is only possible because of the technologies and across the world. And I keep saying this because a lot of people don't understand why I'm as active as I am on social media. Let me... Can I take a few... This rapid... I'm a shoot with one sentence, is it? No, 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 Sadhguru. Go ahead, Sadhguru. See, this happened uh, almost uh, maybe about... 13, 14 years ago, I was in United States and uh, somebody was uh, looking at, you know, we were working together and somebody said, Sadhguru, every day people are typing out about one lakh people or hundred thousand people are typing out the word spirituality on the net. I said, is that so? Then what is it that they're searching for? Let's see. So we typed out spirituality. First thing that comes up is a spa in Mexico. Second, this second thing that comes up is a, a call girl in Northern California 
she is using all that SOP, whatever, spiritual, 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 and she is coming up number two. I thought, this is a shame. When there is a tool like this, that you can reach anybody in the world, when I say this, this is... this generation may not understand this, we must understand this is the first time in the history of humanity that you can sit here and talk to whoever you want, anywhere in the world. Never before this was ever possible. Many great beings have come, all right? Uh, when a Rama came, we don't know if he could really speak to anybody. I don't think he could really open up and speak to anyone, not even one probably. Maybe Hanuman. When Krishna came, only one disciple, only Arjuna he is speaking to. Well, a Buddha came, he spoke to more number of people, but only in one part of the country. A Jesus came, twelve people, one freaked on him, all right? This has been the history of humanity. This is the first time you can sit here and talk to the entire world. When there are tools like this, if we cannot transform humanity now, in this time and age, with the technologies that we have, that means we have no concern for humanity. If we are concerned for humanity, we must put the right things out. We must see what shapes humanity in a positive way towards the well-being of all in an inclusive manner. If we don't do this now with these technologies, it's a clear proof that we have no care or concern for any life on this planet, all right? We might have had many problems till now, but today we have technologies to communicate. We don't even have to knock on their door. We can just go through their window and tell them whatever we want to tell them, wherever they are, all right? When this possibility is there, this is the time to transform this is the time to plan a transformation of humanity. This is a time to move humanity to a profoundness of human nature. This is the time to do it. So let's do that, rather than asking for prediction, is there hope or no hope? If we are that kind of people who are frivolous, there is no hope anyway. But if we are that kind of people, the tools that we have, we are committed to the well-being of humanity, then definitely it is possible this generation is more exposed to variety of human beings around the world like never before. This definitely should manifest as a more inclusive society over a period of time when this excitement about social media and the dating apps and the nonsense is over, this excitement will get over after some time, it's new people are on fire like this. But after that, we will start using social media in a more mature way which is what we are trying to manifest, that are more mature ways of using this and making the world a far more inclusive place than the way it has been for all this millennia. Definitely, that possibility exists and we must make it happen. Thank you, Sadhguru. That's powerful potential there. But uh, something more light-hearted, so very uh, recently we got to know from your team that you're a pretty good cook. So, uh, I just want to ask, what is your favorite dish both to cook and uh, to eat? <laughs> well, my cooking is very different from anything that you have eaten in restaurants and stuff. So, if I tell the names, you won't understand because uh, this uh, comes from communities which are Telugu communities but living in Karnataka, so they imbibed the, the foundation is Telugu cooking, but uh, they imbibed Kannada cooking and they made something else out of it, which is very unique. Only thing is, I would say, don't come and eat my cooking because you will become my slave. If you don't want to be my... <laughs> I'll hold you with the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sadhguru, the next question is that uh, as kids, especially naughty kids, we used to play a lot of pranks on our friends, our families, especially siblings. Uh, so as a kid or even today, did you play pranks and on whom did you play them? All of them. <laughs> Not just on other kids. I played pranks on everybody, teachers, parents, anybody on the street, anybody. <laughs> I didn't spare anyone. Whatever I did, whatever I did, they thought it's a prank. What could I do? <laughs> All right, uh, Sadhguru, uh, this is the last question of the rapid-fire round. 
and a rather important one what would a 63 year old sadguru tell a 24 year old jaggi vasudev oh the 24 year old jaggi vasudev uh, was uh, super successful for those days everything that he did was successful at that time he was not going to listen to a 63 year old man at all <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so with that, uh, we come to the close of this very insightful session. Sadhguru, thank you for your candor. Thank you for your wit. Thank you for your insights. This was something that was very different and unique for us, for all of us here at ISP. And we really look forward to reflecting back upon everything, all these ideas that came through this very enriching conversation. Until next time. Thank you, Sadhguru. Namaskaram. Namaskaram. I would uh, like to wish all the… all of you, three of you and all of the others who are online or who will watch this, you are in a premier institution in a country like India, where millions and millions of young people of your age, for them it's just a dream to be in a institution like this. So you are a privileged few and this privilege that you have to study or to spend these two or three years in uh, such an institution, uh, giving you various skills and possibilities, you must see this as a tremendous empowerment that the whole society is contributing to provide this in some way. So, uh, this empowerment should not go waste just pursuing silly ambitions. You must hold a larger vision for the well-being of the nation and the entire humanity how you can find solutions, how you can create new possibilities. Do not waste your life. When you're highly empowered with education, do not waste your life on silly ambitions of this and that. It's very important that you... If your skills, if your capabilities, your intelligence and the talent and the training that you go through here has to find full expression, you need a very inclusive vision. Please develop that vision for yourself. If you need any help from us, we are always available for this. Please, let's make this happen. Thank you very much. Sadhguru, we'll Thank definitely so. want to follow that. Pranam, please bless us. <laughs>